Sarah, you are as well. Uh, Sherry, congratulations. <laughs> wow, we are so excited. We're so excited. God has been blessing us and moving in us. And listen, we, God has just been finishing the stuff that we've been, that we've been working on. Um, your faithfulness and your diligence um, paid off. I hope you're comfortable. We got the new chairs in. That's what you're sitting on. The new carpeting on the altars up. We did a baby dedication here. Um, Zach and, and Travell dedicated their son, Zach the third. I call him Z3, dedicated him here Friday afternoon. Um, Gloria and Frank Zeller's youngest son, David, was married in here yesterday. So we've just been breaking this place in. We've just been breaking this place in, and it just it feels good to be in the Lord's house. And to the rest of our friends and... and What a worthy God. What a worthy God. What a worthy God we serve. What a worthy God we serve. Listen, I just want to just say, just briefly, just a shout out to our, to our graduates. I know a lot of our folks aren't with us because they're graduating. They've been graduating all weekend. Um, um, Zachary Ellis and Travell, graduated Travell, is doing an MD, PhD program. So she finished her MD portion. She finished a PhD a while ago, finished the MD program over this weekend. Her husband, Zach, got his MBA this week. I, I'm glad about that. Um, Jasmine Zapata received her MD this week. So we got another doctor around. Got a host of our, of our undergrads. Angela, you're here today. Are you here? Can, you just, can your family stand too? Angela has family here. They're going to the graduation soon. We're so proud of you. We're proud of you. Who else? Kim Cry graduating? And, and guests, um, we'll get a chance to acknowledge you later or talk with you later, but we're really glad that you're here. Oh, Saida Parks. Glenn and Tamara's daughter graduating today. So we're just, we're just so glad for folks that are just, who are just excelling in God. And this may just seem like a small thing to you, but I just thank God because if I don't praise him in the small things, I, have to, I, I forget to praise him in the large things. I thank God for air conditioning. Thank you, Jesus. Oh. Because for a minute I was starting to think that the devil was the prince of the air, but I realized... Well, the Bible does talk about them principalities, but the Lord trumps him, so I'm so real, I'm glad. Listen, 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 I'm so, I'm so sorry. So if it gets a little chilly, just hug up to somebody next to you. I'm just sorry. We just got a blast, and we've been waiting for this for a long time. So I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, and, and I really am sorry, but just, you know, you know, praise them, and you'll warm it up. You know, something will happen. I also want to say that I'm grateful to God for, um, for his blessings. I met with some of our young people this week. We call them Project X some young adults who get together and meet. And I just had a chance to spend the whole evening on Thursday with them, but they were heading down in, an a, in, a, um, in a caravan or to, to Jasmine's graduation party. Sister Nikki was driving. Nikki, are you in here, honey? Nikki and Jay and Ron were in a car, and your car was total. I saw a picture of it. Can y'all just stand for just a minute? And walked away on 94, on I-94. <laughs> were hit from behind and pushed into a car up front. God is faithful. God is faithful. Because we're not ready to have any funerals in here yet. We're not ready to have any funerals. Glory to God. Wait, well, yeah, just remain standing for just a minute. Just keep standing for just a minute, y'all. Just keep standing. These are my FOL people just standing around. Allie, why don't you put your camera around here? I want you to pray. Kevin, come here, Pastor Kevin. And y'all, somebody put some, some hands over here, Miss Nikki. Miss Amy, can you help us pray for Nikki who's standing right over here? Lord, I thank you for the protection of these young people, God. This is no small thing. Young people die every day on highways. You've got a purpose for their lives. I pray that they will not be tentative, that they will not be slowful, but that they will shout, that they will see that they serve an invincible God who every once in a while reminds them of their frailty, but his infallibility 
And so we thank you for them and for Ron and for everything that the enemy tries to choke out. Give them quadruple in the name of Jesus. Heal their bodies, strengthen and protect them. Bless Ron as well. Bless those young folks. In Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Come on, let's thank God. Thank you, Jesus. You hear about those kinds of accidents all the time, and they don't end up well. And to see young people going down to celebrate with one of their mentors, and um, Nikki said she was hit from behind. The, the rear windshield went out. Am I getting this right, Nikki? Out into the highway. When I don't know why with the rear impact, it would not have fallen on you, Jordan. I don't know why it did not come in on you, except that... Except that, oh, thank you, Jesus. Except that we forget that we don't serve an ordinary God. We forget that we don't serve a run-of-the-mill God. We forget that even when we go in to celebrate, even when we're laughing and talking in the car, he gives his angels charge over us. He gives his angels charge over us. He gives his angels charge over us. Mama Stedman, that's why I want you to know that while their mothers were someplace else, the angels are watching over them. They got angels in California. They got angels in Hollywood. They got angels just hovering around God's people because he knows mama can't be everywhere. I thank God for that. I praise God for that. I praise God for that. And so I just, I'm telling you, these are some praying young people. I hung out with them on family night. And those of you who know me, I don't do assignments on Thursday nights. I didn't even tell them it was family night until I got there. But I saw this faith and the commitment of these young people who gather and pray and stay up for most of the night so they can come here for fourth watch. I got so fired up, I asked them, could I host one of their gatherings? I told them they can come and camp out at my house, sleep at my house, because they gather like around 7, and then they hang out and then pray, and then they go to fourth watch at 3 o'clock. I told them I would get up and go to fourth watch with them. Because I'm not going to let our young people run and serve God and not run with them. I am not going to let them get excited about God while I'm sitting up someplace. Mm -mm, it's on Thursday night. I can watch Scandal the next day. I'm going to get up. I, I, just, I, I just love young folks that are on fire. It just reminds me. Of us when they were young, us when they're, when they're young, and so you know. And again, hear me out, you all. I'm not trying to. I'm not trying to spiritualize. I'm not trying to say the devil rear-ended them on 94. I'm saying somebody rear-ended them, and uh, no matter who did it, I know who rescued them. I know who protected them, and it wasn't the devil. And so I really am so appreciative of that and God's and God's goodness and how He protects us. I want to read, I want to read a quote from um, an author. His name is Rich Stearns. It's an excerpt from his book, A Hole in Our Gospel. God is concerned about the spiritual, physical, and social dimensions of our being. The whole gospel is truly good news for the poor, and it is the foundation for a social revolution that has the power to change the world. And if this was Jesus' mission, it is also the mission of all who claim to follow him. It is my mission, it is your mission, and it is the mission of the church. It's an excerpt from the whole, of the a whole in our gospel. Richard Stearns is also the CEO of World Vision. There's another quote that I like. It's anonymous. It says, we have shrunk Jesus to the size where he can save our soul, but now don't believe that he can change the world. We have shrunk Jesus to the size where he can save our soul, but now don't believe that he can change the world. The Jesus we serve is a world changer. He wants to infiltrate the world, fill it with his glory, heal it through his people, and teach us his truth. Today is what we celebrate in the church world called Pentecost. The day that means 50th, 
It's the birth of the church. When you read about Acts 2, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, it's 50, 50 days after Passover, it means 50, the Spirit of God fell. I want to talk about the Spirit of God and what the Spirit of God wants to do inside the church, what the Spirit of God wants to do inside of us. And so I've given this a long title. Don't worry about trying to catch everything I say. It's already uploaded to our blog site. It'll already be tweeted and put on our Facebook page. Later on in the sermon, later on in the service, you'll see how to follow us on Twitter or to join our Facebook page. There are also some places in our bulletins where you can, you can do that. There's probably a QR code that'll take you right there. But I want to entitle this Pentecost is the birthday of the church. But where is the guest of honor? I want to encourage the church today. I don't want to bash it because we are the church. You can't bash the church without bashing yourself. The church is not those people. It's us. Whatever it is that's wrong with the church is because we, got, we have to help to fix it. My mother taught me something when she was my Sunday school teacher when I was a kid. She said, the Bible says that the fool has said in his heart there is no God. She also said that in another place of scripture says don't call people fool. She said to me, this is what she rationalized that passage. You should come in contact with people so that they are no longer foolish. They should know that God exists through your love and your life, that they no longer believe that there is no God, that they believe that there is a God. That what she was saying is rather than, you know that passage, that kind of troubling passage that says what happens to you if you call somebody a fool? When I was growing up, I wasn't allowed to call people a fool. That was cussing. Telling somebody that they lied and call somebody a fool. The old church folks would not let you do that because the Bible says you're in, du- you're in danger of the judgment fire. But my mom put a twist on it. She said, maybe it's not so bad. Maybe it's not just the word fool that's bad, but maybe it's the fact that the fool has said in his heart there is no God. And maybe if you lived a little differently, the fool would no longer say in his heart there is no God. And so maybe God is saying, rather than calling them a fool, treat them like you're a fool for Christ so that they become a follower of Christ so that they are no longer foolish. Did y'all catch that? We need to interact in a way that allows people to know that God is true, that God is real. And so I'm glad to be a part of the body of Christ with all of our issues, all of our isms, all of our stuff. I am still proud to be a part of it because it is the only entity that God has called his own. It's the only entity that he's called or referred to as the bride of Christ. It is that only entity. So whatever is wrong with it, we need to get busy fixing it. So if the church is lying, then pray against it. And if the church is crooked, then let's get right. Let's get right people in it. If the church doesn't develop leaders, let's start developing them. If the church doesn't care for the poor, then let's start caring for the poor. But let's just stop talking about what the church is not doing and let's become what the church is supposed to be. Anyone can point fingers and say what the church isn't, but what are you doing to make it better? So I want to know where the guest of honor is. And I want to talk about the church. And I want to talk about the role of the church. And I want to talk about what it is Jesus has called us to do. Minister Patrick read to us today from Acts 1, and he also read to us from a passage in Isaiah 61. I love the passage in Isaiah 61 because it's very, very challenging. In fact, um, I want you all to write that down and make note of it. I want you to read chapter 61. Now, sometimes when the pastor tells you to read stuff, you think that I mean to the weak people or to the strong people. Maybe I mean to my leaders or maybe I mean to just a few people. But I really mean to anyone who can read. I'd like for you to read Isaiah 61. So if that's not you, you don't have to. But I'm just saying, I want you to begin to read it. Because it's one thing to proclaim the word and to, 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 to build upon it, but it's another thing to speak into it, to, let it read, to read it and let it speak to your heart. Today in teen Sunday school, I spoke to my students about how we hear from God. And I use an ancient practice of where you read scripture and listen to it. And you read it again and listen to it. And you read it again and listen to it. And I watched 15 and 16-year-old boys tell me what scripture was saying to them. But you can't tell me what scripture is saying to you if you have not gotten in it. Part of us in doing what we've got to do and owning up to our mission is that we've got to become people of the word. People of the word. Here's a little plug. We kicked off adult Sunday school today. We kicked it off, so I want y'all to know. Brother Hawkins, I appreciate that. And we had some folks up in there, but I want you all to know every Sunday morning, every Sunday morning, we have adult Sunday school. Right now, well, just come on in. We'll tell you where it is. I think we're going to outgrow the room we're in today. But I want you to know we are, we are helping people to study God's word on Wednesdays, helping people to study God's word on Sunday mornings, because I want you to walk around informed about what God is saying to you. I want you to walk around informed about that so that we are filled with God's word. God's word lets us know who we are and who God is inside the world. So Jesus, when he's called to preach and he's called to minister, I'm going to get to Isaiah in just a moment. I'm going to get to Acts 1 in just a moment. 
But when Jesus was beginning his preaching message, he preached Isaiah 61. He stood up in the tabernacle, in the, in the synagogue, and he read it. And he gave it back to someone. And uh, I think it said he sat down, and it said all eyes were on him. And then he said, today scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. That whoever this was that Isaiah was talking about, he's standing right here in this little synagogue in Capernaum. I'm right here. Now, it's very interesting that the passage that he would preach, that he would read from, would indicate some importance. That you would think of all the things that the creator of Scripture, the creator of the universe, the creator of the world could elaborate upon, that of all Scripture, he would choose one from Old Testament, from Isaiah chapter 61, that says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. We're going to begin to understand why the Spirit falls on us for Pentecost. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. And he begins to talk about what it does and what it means. It's, a, it's upon me because he has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom to the captives. Jesus only read an excerpt to it. But if you're going to really be a follower of Jesus, then you've got to read what Jesus was reading. That's why people who are studying and researching blog and post what they're reading. Because if you like what this person is saying about something, then read what's informing them. If you've got someone, you know, who you really think, you know, does, if you, if Sister Tracy, if you're quoting people that's doing great youth ministry, then you might want to read what they're reading that's giving them those kinds of insights. Yeah. Sister Katrina, if you like what someone's saying about prayer, well, what are they reading that's informing that? If you really love Jesus and you want to be a follower of Jesus, don't just read that passage where he got up and read something in Isaiah and sat down. Read what he was fully alluding to. Because he read that chapter. And that chapter talks not only about the brokenhearted, but it talks about God's response to it. It talks about breaking down systems. It talks about breaking the bands of those that are oppressed. It talks about not just coming into God's house, beating a tambourine, shouting and dancing and singing, but it talks about leaving God's house, breaking oppression that's holding people back from being who they're, suppo who they're supposed to be inside God's kingdom. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, to release the darkness of the prisons, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of the vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to provide for those who grieve in Zion, to, be, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, oil of gladness instead of mourning, a garment of praise instead of the spirit of despair. That really, we can't help the world get its joy if we don't have ours. We cannot help the world to get its, and so you better get yours. And you better have it, and you better come here with it. Go to work with it, get in your car with it. I don't know about you all, but I don't wait till I come to church to get my joy. I walk up in here with joy. I wake up with joy. I lay down with joy. But if the church doesn't realize fully who we are and how we flourish and how we function in God, then we miss an opportunity to really help the world to understand that God is coming to really set them free. So this is interesting. Jesus is saying, you know, and, and, and those of you who, who, um, who come out of certain church traditions may, may understand this. This happens in, and, and this may happen in a whole lot of places. In fact, I saw this um, when I was at um, Covenant's um, annual meeting a few weeks ago that there were candidates for ordination who had about 10 minutes to talk to explain their call. Many of you that, that, that may have been trained for ministry might have shared your, your call how did God call you? What, when did you know God was putting his hands on you? So I would imagine that this being Jesus' inaugural sermon was trying to lay out what he was really about. I'm sure he probably got up and said, first give an honor to God who is <laughs> me. Um, to all the priests, crooks, money changers. I want to talk to you today about my call and my ministry, but I want to let you know what it's about. I want to read the ancient scrolls of a prophet who penned this about six or seven hundred years ago. And this man has such laser accuracy that seven hundred years ago he spoke about me and today. And speaking of me, he said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. If you think that we've come and we're serving this nice Jesus, he's a lot of things and he's sweet and he's kind, but Jesus ain't nothing nice. Not to those who love the status quo, not to those who love to hoard power, not to those who love to hold on to food and access. Jesus is not something nice to them. We have just shrunk in Jesus so that he's just about our church, our denomination, our project, that he's about all of these things. 
And we forget that he is really about the community. That to think that Jesus is just about fountain of life is crazy because fountain of life only exists because there's something Jesus wants to do in the world. That we don't exist because God just thought, you know, I love them people down there. They're smart. They love worship. They come together. They're, 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 they're well-mannered. They got cute kids. They've got air conditioning. I can work with them. We exist because of a mission that he wants to do in the world. But I want us to understand this whole thing about going. That it is not about just staying inside. We have gotten, the church has gotten so comfortable with staying inside. And we think that it's just the responsibilities of a few to go outside. But really, that call is only to those who come inside. If you never come inside, then that call is not to you. Only to those who feel that God has given them a call and a mission and a purpose has he called to go back outside. Back outside to do something with those that are hurt, who are hurting and who are broken. So then what is the good news? Because Jesus said he came to proclaim this. Is this making sense? The good news is not that you get to go to heaven. When I invited my friend, some of you might have seen Pastor David Smith around here today. He came by and I gave him a little quick tour. But he came by. Remember when I led him to the Lord when we were about 12 years old? We were eighth graders at Lincoln Middle School. It was a middle school at the time. He was working on a bicycle, and I didn't know how to share my faith. I didn't know how to quote all these scriptures and stuff, but he and Val Quarles had a bike upside down and trying to put a chain back on it, and I walked up to him and said, I get to go to heaven. <laughs> and I said it in a provocative kind of teasing way, and like, and you don't. And I hadn't really honed my evangelism skills, so I probably did mean that. And they looked at me and said, well, why do you get to go? Not how do we go, but why do you? <laughs> that might tell a bit about me. Why do you get to go? And you know what? The church has gotten more sophisticated in some ways, but the truth is, that's still how we preach it. What would you do if you were to die tonight? What would you do if in the next five minutes you take your last breath? That's not good news. Good news is, are you hurting? I know a balm for your heart. Are you crying? I know someone who will dry your tears. Are you fearful? I know someone who will hold your heart and strengthen it. Are you lonely? I know someone who will be with you. Have your dreams been dashed? I know the dream giver, the dream maker, the dream catcher, the dream restorer. The good news is not that God is going to come. The good news is, God is here. That's a whole different message. I need y'all to hear what I'm saying. That's a a whole different thing. That he's here. That the good news, and and, and, and the the prophets of old said he's coming, he's coming, he's coming. They They were foretelling of it. But when John the Baptist came, he started preaching the good news. He said, the king is here. Not that he's going to come, the king is here, and that his arrival is here, and his place in the earth, his place with eternity is now here. Now listen, you got to understand why Herod got so upset, because if Herod thought, if the king is here, I'm no longer king. Now if Herod, now, now, why does that exist? Now, I just got to, let me just step back for just a second, that's not my sermon, let me just say this real quick. Why would scripture show us a nervous physical king being upset about a new king coming? Because he knew that if that king arrived, he'd have to get up off his throne. Herod only exists to tell us a story so that we understood what was happening behind the curtain in the spiritual realm. That as Satan began to understand that the king had arrived, he knew the king because he bowed before him. He knew the king because he sang before him. He danced before him. He worshiped before the king. But it had been a long time since Satan or Lucifer and the king had an audience together. So when the king came into the world, you better know Lucifer knew. And so Herod gets nervous so that we understand that Herod is just a pawn of Satan. And if Herod is getting nervous about his kingdom, then you know Satan is getting nervous about his kingdom as well. What made Satan nervous was not that in a billion years Jesus is going to come back and snatch the church away to heaven because he would say, good, I got a billion years to screw this planet over. If Satan thought, okay, he's here, but he only got about 30 years, then he's going to go back up there and prepare a place for like a billion years, and then one day come back riding on that cloud, but until then, I'm going to get children, I'm going to make people fight against each other and hate each other and murder each other. No, 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 that's not what the enemy was hearing. 
He understood what the church has not yet understood. The kingdom of God is now. The kingdom of God is here. The king is here. The king is already here. He's not coming. He's coming to get the church that's moving in his stead. But he, he is already here. He is already here, so that means something. That means rules change. That means rules change. It means rules change. My daughter got picked on a pl- got picked on and bullied on a playground when she was in kindergarten. That's my only child. And I'm saved, but that wasn't Sunday. Maybe say this way: I'm saved, but I ain't that saved. No, I'm not. Because I know how to repent in jail. (laughs) Not that I've ever done it. But when I came, some of you know the story, but when I came to school and saw the scar on her chin and her holding, you know, a frozen sponge to it, I said, get the principal and show me the boy. (laughs) When we walked up on the playground, I felt the tension in her whole body. I felt her little hand just tighten up. I said, oh, no, no, baby. (laughs) Oh, no. It ain't like, no, 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 no. Shake it off, shake it off, shake it off. Now, we didn't hurt anybody. We didn't go to jail. But what I need her to know, understand is you are not going to be afraid on your playground. This was an eighth grade boy. Ended up being expelled and stuff. We got it, we got it together. And I, talk, I didn't do anything to the kid. I talked with him and his mom. But the rules changed when daddy showed up. Because it might have been a playground, and it might have been a principal and a patrol officer, but now there's somebody related to you, somebody who understands you. Somebody who stood there and the doctor said, I don't think she's going to make it. Somebody who diapered you. Somebody who fed a tube through your nose to your stomach so that you could eat when you wouldn't take a bottle. You have somebody who has a vested interest in you, and I'm paying good money at this school, and you are not going to be bullied on this playground. And if you leave this school, because we both going to be kicked out. <laughs> now, what happens to many of us is that we don't understand how to take teachable moments and apply them to our lives. Why is it then that I walk into a bank and act like my daughter when she's in first grade, like there's a bully, when I need a bump, when I need a loan? Why is it when I walk into a foundation's office, I tense up like my daughter, like I don't have a father holding my hand? Why is it that when we walk into a mediation situation, we begin to tighten up like we don't have a father in the situation? The kingdom ain't coming. The kingdom is here. The kingdom is not finna come. It's not getting ready to come. It's not about to come. The kingdom of God is here. The kingdom of God is here, which means the rules change. When the kingdom of God is here, it means you can start swinging again. No, we're not going to stand on the wall. No, you're not going to be standing inside because it's hot outside. No, the kingdom of God is here. You're going to play on this playground, and I'm going to stand here until you get comfortable doing it. And then I'm going to slip out once you got the rhythm of it again, then you keep on playing. The kingdom changes. Why are we still fearful if the kingdom is here? Why are we still lying if the kingdom is here? Why are we still cheating if the kingdom is here? Why are we still half-stepping if the kingdom is here? The kingdom of God has arrived. It has been inaugurated in the presence, in the birth, the life, the death, the resurrection, the ascension of Christ. And when heaven looks at earth, They're understanding. They understand. It is in good hands. Because the spirit. Because the spirit. Is moving. He wants to reveal himself. He wants to reveal himself to us. So that we understand. That his kingdom is here. That means eternity is not going to happen. Eternity has begun. What you're waiting for has already happened. That bus you're waiting to leave has already happened. 
You better get up on it. So listen, let me tell you something. When you make this shift, you begin to pray differently, begin to think differently. When you understand that the kingdom of God is here, you stop acting like you got to ask for the guest house. When you know that the kingdom of God is here, you're like, this house says guest on. I need some family towels. I don't want to sit in the guest section. I want to sit in the family section. I don't want to sit in the visitor section. And so the good news is the arrival of the kingdom of God. It has been inaugurated by birth, life, death, resurrection, and ascension, and the empowerment of the church through Jesus Christ. Let me just give you some background. Do I have that Genesis through Malachi thing? Okay, thank you, Karen. You know y'all good. I want to talk about God's partnership with humanity. I'm just going to go through this quickly, but it's already printed, so I'm going to try to write all this stuff down. What do we learn about God through scripture? One, that God goes first. In the beginning, God. You and I didn't do anything to beckon God's attention. What you need to understand about God's heart and God's nature, and this is why going means so much, is that when God says go to us, he's really saying join in my nature. You understand what I'm saying? You are never more like God than when you go to someone else's rescue. I know we put a higher value on prayer and reading and and consecrating and studying and devotion and quiet time. But everything you read and pray should tell you to go. You understand what I'm saying? You read scripture to understand how he wants you to go. You pray to hear when he wants you to go. You get in community to tell you where he wants you to go. But none of that says sit still, put up your feet and stay. None of it. So the purpose of scripture is to remind us that we are to go. So we see, first of all, that God goes, that no one is called. No one, no, one, no one is called to God. God comes to us first. Then God establishes partnership. So we understand through Scripture you're not supposed to do this stuff by your own. Then God endorses that partnership. Sin emerges. Just a quick overview of Scripture. God, sin emerges and interrupts the partnership. It dulls our senses and it creates a self-help consciousness. I can get myself right all by myself, which further gets you away from God. Because meanwhile, God is talking. But all you hear inside your head is, I got this. I got this. I got this. My heart is hurting. I got this. I'm nervous. I got this. I'm fearful. I got this. I got this. I got this. So that self-help consciousness that you can do it. Then we see Noah, and God is still trying to partner. I want you to see this. I'm just trying to give you a quick history. He's trying to partner. The rest of this world is jacked up. So let me just put the good ones in a boat. Let me serve the good ones and just start this thing all over again. Let's get the news. So they floating. They floating. All right. Then it gets them off. Then the good ones start getting drunk and doing stuff. And then the daughters start trying to have kids with them. And just craziness breaks out. Then we go a little bit further. And then there's Abraham. And God says, you know what? You believe God. You believe me. And I like that thing in your heart. So I'm going to build a line through you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use you, Abraham, to bless your seed. I want to, I'm still trying to get into the world. It's like Matrix. I'm still looking for a line. I'm still trying to get in, and so I tried to get it with Adam, but then he sinned. And then the Noah and the boat, but then they didn't want to do right. So Abraham, you're my man. But then Abraham has a bunch of sons, but it's not all of his sons. There's one son, Jacob, that he chooses. And it is through Jacob, who's also called Israel, it's through his lineage that the Messiah is going to be born. So then you keep going down, and then so Jacob goes down, and Joseph goes down. Joseph brings his dad down eventually to Egypt because there's a famine, and they want some food. They're there for 400 years. God raises up Moses to lead them out of Egypt back into their promised land. So then he brings them out to make them a people. He didn't bring them out because they were good or smart or deserved to not be enslaved. He told Pharaoh, I'm bringing them out that they may praise me. If you don't understand why God has brought you out of slavery, he just might let you wander back into it. We have been freed from God, by, God, from, by God from the enemy to live lives unto God. Is that making sense? So he brought them out of Egypt so they could praise God. He also told Pharaoh, and I want you to get this. I want you to know, because I want you to understand where Pharaoh's sitting. I love the way God talks right to people. Listen, listen, listen. Don't be arguing with people about God. That's not your job. Your job is not to argue with people. Keep doing it. See how, see how successful you are. Live it, and it's harder to argue with what's happening in your life. Walk it out and find out what happens. If they just want an argument, you don't have time for that foolishness. But if they're arguing and they're really hungry, then say, look, if you really mean what you're saying, ask God if this is real, show me. That's what I say to folks. Because God can explain the gospel much better than you can. I can live it out. 
and I can exegete it and put verses up together, but God gives the aha in the middle of the night. God gives you the aha when your mom is sick and you need to believe something. So let's invite God into the situation. Stop trying to get people told and get people healed. And so he brings them all out. He brings them, he brings them out of that Egyptian bondage so that they can become a nation. Because it is through this nation, the nation only exists so that the Messiah can be born. So that the Messiah can be born. See, we miss this stuff. We keep reading stuff saying, how do people keep forgetting how good God is to them? Let me tell you, the church is doing the same thing. Whatever you saw Israel doing in the Old Testament, we're doing right now. Is this making sense? So Moses is leading them out. They got a tabernacle. They got a place where God meets them. Then you have judges and kings. Who are trying to tell people, stay right, stay right, stay right. The Messiah is going to come. If you mess up, he won't, he won't use our lineage. Stay clean, stay clean, stay clean. David's family comes. David's the king. God says, your, your seat is going to sit on the throne forever. Talking about Jesus. He ain't talking about Solomon. He's talking about Jesus. It's going to be on the throne forever. Then you get the major and the minor prophets, which doesn't mean big ones and little ones. It's talking about the size of their books. The major prophets are no more spiritual than the minor prophets. It's just that they have longer writings. So Daniel and, and, and Isaiah are major prophets. But then you get people like Nahum and Habakkuk who are minor prophets. They write smaller books. Then there's 400 years of silence where God is not talking through prophets between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Then in the New Testament, the Messiah comes. And the Messiah is coming. Keep this in mind. What failed with Abraham, what, I'm going to go back, what failed with Adam what failed with his sons, what failed with Noah, God tried to redeem through Abraham. People kept sinning. They went out into, you know, Egyptian slavery, not because they were sinning, but they went down there looking for bread. He brought them out through Moses. Some of them died in the wilderness. He chose, he chose one, of, one, of, one of Abraham's um, seed. He chose Jacob through his lineage with the Messiah come. So when Jesus comes, he is directly connected with the prophets. He's directly connected with why Moses brought them out. He's directly connected with, with Jacob and with Joseph and with, with, with Isaac and with Abraham. He is connected with the covenant of God that's been coming down through the lines for centuries so that he could come and tell the world, go. Not to fight and split hairs and argue over versions of the Bible. Not to point fingers at each other. Not to argue over worship and, and, and how you baptize and how you dedicate babies. He did not call you to fight and spit on each other and to raise all kind of hell and devilment. He came to tell you, go. People are broken. I broke out through this lineage. God came through this broken lineage of human beings. I have fought and come through lines of whores and harlots and murderers and baby killers just to come into the world to tell you, go to whores and harlots and baby killers and murderers and drug dealers and ex -offenders. Go to them and tell them God loves them, God forgives them, God sees them, repent, turn, get hope, get help, get strength, and tell somebody else. The Messiah then lives out his whole life. Then after he, he dies and he's raised from the dead, he gathers all the disciples back in Jerusalem in an upper room and breathes on them and sends the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit then sends them out because you know what? They don't like to go. People don't like to go. So then persecution breaks out on the church. So people start running away from Jerusalem to save their lives. And every place they go, they preach. And they preach over here. They preach over there. That's how the word begins to spread all across the world. And then the Spirit then empowers the church the church not the congregation the church when we say church big C that's code in pastoral world it means all the people of God everywhere it really means all the people of God that have ever existed and that exists it particularly pertains to those who are existing now but it means touch and love the world. So now the church is called to do what God really wanted Noah to do. The church now has become what he wanted Abraham to come. He told Abraham, I'm going to bless your seed. Now he's telling the church, go get them and I'll bless them. Go get the drug dealers. Go get the game bangers. Go, go get the white collar criminals. Go get the ex offenders. Go get them. Go get them. Go get them. And if you bring them and disciple them and love them, I'm going to accept them. Go get them. Go get them. He told Abraham, I'm going to bless your seed. Everybody that gets saved becomes part of Abraham's seed. We are now called to do what they were called to do in the Old Testament. And we read it and think them fools. They just, they just forgot God's promise. And here we are. We are now the chosen people called by God. And we're wrestling 
Does go really mean go? What do you mean by go, God? How go do you want me to go? How gone do you want me to be? Go going, go gone. What do you mean when you say go? Because I go a lot. I go a lot, God. I got a lot on my mind. I go a lot. I do a lot of going. There's a lot of going to be going on, God. There's a lot going on. What do you mean when you tell me to go? What do you mean go? I go all the time. I work hard. What do you mean go? He means go until you've been gone. Go until they see Christ. Go until they feel him. Until they hear him. Go until their tears are dried. Go until their bellies are filled. Go until their children are rocked to sleep. Go until they're no longer lonely. Go until they're no longer broken. Go until they're no longer fearful. Go until they're no longer destroyed. Go until they believe that they are loved. Go until they are seen. Go until they can hear God's voice for themselves. And then keep going. And then once you go, take them with you and go with them. But let me tell you, let me tell you the beauty of God's message to us. Final life, we're about to experience some tremendous effectiveness and growth. But it's going to come through going. It's going to come through going. And you know who's going to go? You. Because I'm supposed to go too, but you know what I'm supposed to do as a pastor, as a shepherd? I'm supposed to stand right here in Brittany and tell you to go. Beth, to tell you and Hyler, go and how to go. How to know the go and where the go is and how to figure out. And, this, and, 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 and Minister Lele is going to talk about this a little bit later, but how you figure out what that go is later on this month. Because once you understand where that go is, there's nothing like going where God tells you to go. I'll tell you, I have had a lot of joy. I've been all over the world, jumped out of planes, done some crazy stuff. But there is no joy, no adventure like knowing that you are going with God. There is nothing like God waking you up and saying, boy, get up, get up. Put your shoes on, let's go. And then you watch yourself walking with God and going with God and bringing hope into places where there is no hope. I love it. We have become God's chosen people and betrothed people. Y'all still with me? The church's greatest strength is its mission, its God, its power, and its witness. This is the greatest strength of the church, its mission, its God, its power, its witness. I heard someone say, I think it's David Blesh, um, study some of his stuff when I, was, when I was in school. He said, the church doesn't have a mission. The mission has a church. Think about that. The church does not have a mission. God's mission has a church to carry it out. The greatest weakness of the church, its comfort, its self-absorption, and self-reliance, its fairy tale understanding of scripture, and its oblivion to its mission. The greatest weakness of the church is its comfort, its self-absorption, and self-reliance, its fairy tale understanding of scripture, and its oblivion to its mission. Can I be honest with you all for just a minute? Y'all got about 10 more minutes in you? Well, you better, because that's what I got for you. (laughs) Thank you all. I appreciate that. (laughs) We must stand in front of God. And this isn't fair. This isn't scary. This is just fact. We must stand in front of God and give an account with what we have and what we do. And you fall two ways. Either you help the mission of God or you block it. I mean, that's just honest. That's not, that's not scare tactics. I'm not about to ask you what happens if you die tonight. The truth of the matter is, it's going to be real basic. Here's the mission. How did you empower it? How did you live it out? How did you block it? Knowing that, how would you not get yourself in God's word to understand what it's saying to you and how you're supposed to be and what you're supposed to do? I know you know it, and you feel like you know it, and you can read the books of the Bible, and your grandmama told you about it, and you can talk about Noah, and you can talk about David. But do you understand how the story is really woven together and how it really is summarized and capitalized in Jesus and what he has given to us when he says go, that the authority that he has given us is more powerful? more powerful than the ministry of David, more powerful than the ministry of Moses, more powerful than the prophets because they foretold of the prophet, the prophet lives in us. The prophet that they talked about 700 years in advance lives in me 2,000 years after the fact. Isaiah looked 700 years in the future to see Jesus. That Jesus now has been living in the earth and in people's hearts for 2,000 years. 
You don't even understand what you're sitting on and what you have and how God has called us, how he has called us to change the world. It's taken millennia. It's taken, because you're not supposed to say millenniums. It's taken millennia to move from Eden to Calvary, from Sinai to Pentecost in the upper room in Jerusalem. But in 2,000 years, we have moved from cutting-edge world changers to egocentric money changers who are addicted to status quo. Karen, is that one up there? Did I just, is that up there? And I put my little pound sign Gism so y'all know. <laughs> Those of you follow me on Twitter. It's taken millennia to move from Eden to Calvary, from Sinai to Pentecost. It means thousands of years, but in 2,000 years, the church has lost ground. We have reduced our call to be world changers, to be mere money changers who are addicted to status quo. I need to repent to the people of God, the people here at Fountain of Life. I need to repent to you. This isn't part of the sermon. This is true. I find myself talking more about church partnership than I do discipleship. I talk more about, mis- about membership than discipleship. Now, sometimes as pastors, we, mi- we misunderstand the two and think they're one and the same, that if you become a part of the church, you are committed to discipleship. I have found over the years that's not true. You can like church and not like Jesus. Y'all, can, y'all don't have to say nothing. Which is why we can fill pews, but we can't change streets. We can fill choirs, but we can't feed hungry. We can feel buildings, but we can't or won't feel bellies. We can evaluate others, but can't change grades. We can celebrate new houses, but we won't end homelessness. Here's something I want to mess with my church people for just a minute. The church is God's vehicle for training, empowering, and releasing his solution. The church is not the solution. Christ and his message are. Can I say that again? I'm calling us to discipleship. I need to be with men and women who know and love the word and then have the power to forgive it. The power to live it so they are forgiven fully so they're broken from the past that they have to fully live what God has given them. We need to be walking preachers, teachers, and evangelists. You can't just invite people to your church. You must invite yourself to people's pain. Do you hear what I'm saying? This call is not for final life to tell people, come to my church. I'm not saying you can't invite people, but do the work first. Talk to people. Hear their pain. Hear their hearts. Hear their stories. Love them. Help them with their children. Be the church to them, and then get around to inviting them to where you worship. But if you don't have anything going on that's attractive, they ain't going to come with you. Now, this is a different way because pastors will tell you, go get them, go tell them. We got the carpet we got the chairs. Go get them, champ. No, 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 no. You, you heal. You, you love. You listen. You cuddle. You coddle. You become the church of the God's people. God's people. I'm doing all right. I'm doing all right. Hear me. Let me preach this by myself. No, I'm saying to people because I want you to hear what I'm saying. I'm not saying to be me. I want you to hear what I just hear what I'm saying because the church is at a critical juncture. I know it's hard being a pastor. That's why you shouldn't do it unless you call. Amen. You shouldn't do it because it's hard. Because I need you to hear what I'm saying. For all these years, and listen, Madison is a laughing stock in the Christian world. Churches don't stay. People don't stay, people don't do right, people don't love, people don't change. They think preaching and ministry is just about money, and don't let it be black churches. Don't let it be smaller churches. All this kind of stuff that's out there. We need to break out the mold. There's folks here that have been healed and changed. Your marriages are intact because of this ministry. Your husband is sober because of this ministry. Your son is out of prison because of this ministry. Because of God's goodness and God's grace and God's kindness, that's what we need to preach, not carpeting and pews. We need to tell people. You need to look them straight in the eyes, Alicia, and let, let me tell you where I've been so I can tell you where Jesus is going. Let me tell you how this thing is going to play out. Let me tell you what he'll do for you. Let me tell you how it'll work out. 
Arian, young men need to know who feel like they have no choice. They have no options. They, they have nothing else to do. I'm only doing wrong because, because I have no other options. Statistics and scripture tells us not, that that's not true. You can choose right until something better comes along. You ain't got to do wrong in criminal activity just because you ain't got nothing better to do. You can go home and make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. You can watch Oprah. You can watch Ellen. You can, you can come over here and volunteer and help set up some shares. You ain't got to do criminal stuff just because you ain't got nothing better to do. But the church... A lot of our folks, we can't, a lot of our brothers, you're stuck and stagnant in church because you don't want to just come church and fan yourself and listen to choirs and sing songs about I love you, Jesus. Can I squeeze your hand, Jesus? Blow my hair gently while I praise you, Jesus. I'm not making fun of worship, so I'm just saying men don't like to get down like that. But Father Flager says that behind a church, Brian Woodland grew up in that church, knew on Friday nights they would get men to go shut down crack houses. Now that's something men can get their teeth into. They don't want to just sit here and just talk about how lovely are your dwelling places. We want to get out and go break down the devil's dwelling places. Let's go free somebody. Let's, 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 go, let's go set somebody free. Let's go drag somebody out of a crack house. Let's go get a boy off the street. Let's go show somebody they ain't really tough. Let's go jump somebody out a gang they was jumped into. I bet you a whole lot of boys would come out of a gang if a whole lot of men walked down the street and said, listen, I know y'all got this blood in, blood out thing, but you know, it's a whole bunch of us deacons, saints, and friends. We might look old and kind of sanctified, <laughs> but you know, um, Brother Michael, we can throw down if we need to. Go. That's going. Go. You start talking like that to men, you have a church full of people like, I can be saved and fight. Yeah! <laughs> How do we can do that? We can do that. <laughs> what are we going to do? Some man beating down a woman on the street, going, no, 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 no. We're going to speak in tongues and forth. Watch. But on the corner, you're going to leave her down and get a good old fashioned beat down. Now, I know some of y'all are getting really trouble, but that's all right because I ain't talking to you. I'm talking to folks who understand. Instead of preaching looked and felt like that, we get more of our brothers and sons in here who don't want to just sit up and just doze for two and three hours. How can we change the world? Because really there's something inside of you. That's why you used to tie a towel around your neck and pretend like you were Superman and Batman and Spider-Man and Plastic Man and Stretch Armstrong and all them other people. Because there's a part of you that felt like you, there's a part of you that wanted to feel invincible and a part of you that wanted to feel like you could make the world change. And then you come to church and we just cut stuff off. I didn't mean to go here, but I'm just here now. We don't teach people how to live on the edge and to serve God. When people gathered to pray in the old days, in Acts, their lives were on st at, at stake. Miss Kirby, when the old slaves would sneak out to the fields at night to pray, their lives were at stake. That it was either, it was either if I called out the sweet Jesus, I might see him. Because if they catch me, they're going to kill me. But yet they pray. We try to find out the weather to decide if we're going to go to church or not. And we have not trained the church to go. I don't want people that are addicted to me. Because what you do when you're addicted to something is that you use it up, then you look for something else. Oh, thank you, Jesus. But I want you addicted to Jesus and his word and his spirit because it can never be used up. The church is really the portal. It's the doorway to the kingdom. The church is not God's solution. The church walks in partnership with God to get people to change the world. In fact, God's best work is not being done inside church. His best work is not, but the training to do that happens to it. Let me just talk about some of these folks for just a minute. I, I lost my order because so I just have to turn around and look. But um, just talk, I want to talk to you for a minute just for ordinary, about ordinary folks outside of church. These are two women I met when I was in Udon Thani. That's the northern hills of Thailand. These are women who wanted to bring grace and salvation to their communities. So they founded a fish hatchery, and they worked with the University of Thailand to create technology to grow and sell a million fry a week. They sell the fish. You know what they do with the proceeds? They fund house church led by female pastors. Because they're not getting funding. There's no denomination doing it. So they sell fish to fund 30 house churches. I met the past. We had communion. We had rice, not bread, because this was Asia. This is Thailand. They don't break bread. They break rice. Because 
Because over there, Jesus is the rice of life. <laughs> the next one. It's a bad slide, but this is Ron Ruthruff. He was one of my instructors in seminary. Created a home for runaway teens in Seattle. Because everybody can say just go home, stay off the streets, but he knew that most of the children that were on the streets were there because they were abused at home, beat up at home, sold into prostitution. So he created a ministry where young runaways who can't go back to home and don't want to become a ward of the state can go and shower, get personal products, get cleaned up, and then go back out to living on the streets. Now, I know we love to have them go back home, but sometimes home is so hellish they can't go back home. But he just gives them a little oasis, just a little place where they can come, and while they're there and eating their meal and brushing up and getting deodorant and toothpaste, they share the love of Christ while they're at their most tenuous moment in their lives. That's Mother Verlene. <laughs> Young woman who walked away from God for most of her life, but her children wanted to serve God, and she recommitted her life to God. And had the audacity, find out, listen, there are always bold, brash people in the world, and you never know when God needs them. When you need something new, God calls on the bold people. My mother asked Pastor Ford, would he drive from Chicago to establish this ministry? He laughed in her face. But three months later, the Holy Spirit laughed in his face and said, I want you to get in your car and drive three hours to Madison, Wisconsin. There are only two adults and six kids for seven years in that house church. But we are who we are today because this one woman said to her pastor, can you come to Madison because me and my kids need a church? She also needed a new dress, but we'll get to that later. This is my buddy and partner in crime, Pastor Peter Arn, from Metro Church in New York. He went on a missions trip to South Africa. It's interesting. He loves him some Africa, and I love Korea. <laughs> he took me to Africa for the very first time, and I invited him to Korea for the first time since he left as a sick baby, three months old. He saw a woman who had a heart. She had gone through divorce. She was, a, she was a doctor's wife. Her husband did some stuff, divorced her. And um, she wanted to do a ministry that empowered women. He heard her vision. He came back to the United States and created a board for her. They have a board. They raise money in New York. They have art galleries. They raise money. They have now funded something that's called Zamele Ministry, where they take women who can't read and have created a microfinance industry. When these women come and save their money, write down the interest calculated by hand. I have pictures of their books. They take attendance. They compute interest, um, late fees. If you pay late, late fees. And women can't even spell their names, but they write an X as they take the bag of money home and put it under the pillow. They take the whole community village's money home because she is the bank that night. And this brother created the money to start that ministry. It is touching lives. I was with him as we served a man dying of AIDS, his mom could not um, change him. But just because he had AIDS to her and to us did not mean that he had to die without his dignity. Yes, yes. Pastor Peter, Terrell Fletcher, and I bathed a grown man because just because he was dying did not mean that he had to go to his grave smelling like urine. And we walked outside as grown men, just silent and thinking, this is what it means. It's one thing, it's one thing to say be fed. It's another thing to wash your brother down, to let him know God loves you. And Jesus, don't want this and don't want this. But this brother created that outside the church. My sister, Loleta G, had a vision that young teen mothers who are victims of sexual abuse should not live on the streets. So God gave her the wisdom to acquire a house on Madison's west side and to take a couple of rooms and have some people decorate them. I think, is this the Harriet Tubman room? Or is this, this is the Harriet Tubman room where a group of professional women came together and decorated it. And in the next few weeks, a young woman who would normally be on the streets is going to be able to live in this place with her baby and get, li get life-changing <laughs> services and prayer and support outside the church, outside the church. Jerome Dillard, Anthony Cooper, Dr. Karen Reese are folks who have realized Madison and Wisconsin have incarcerated men way too long and way too much. 
have committed their lives outside of church. Karen is a researcher extraordinaire who's putting together community forums. She put together my talk that I gave to Rotary this week, which I think went very well, but put that together for me. Jerome Dillard has committed his life to advocating for men, going into jail with men and women, asking, asking judges to reduce their sentences, helping men that have no clothing, giving him money out of his own wallet, clothing off his own back. This is outside the church. Anthony Cooper is helping to train men and place them in jobs. These two men work together with Brother Willie to provide housing for men who are in an emergency situation. This is not inside the church, but this is the church. This is people going. I don't have enough pictures or time to talk about Miss Jackie Hunt who came to this church with an ankle bracelet on and now she's a certified and licensed mental health professional. <laughs> or her daughter, Jakeisha Hunt, who spent time being cared for others while her mom was incarcerated, but now she's caring for young ladies who can experience that pain, who have experienced that pain. Or brothers like Kaleem Care, who's wanted to make this city a place that people can live in and feel good about. Or people like my brother Michael Johnson, who are believing in the educational achievement of our kids, a safe, clean place for our kids. <laughs> Kim Berovich, who wants to make sure that folks who are homeless have a place to go where they can be fed and their children can be tutored and they can be treated with dignity and has helped to coordinate a team of people from this church with others around this community to make sure that just because you're homeless does not mean that you have to be dignity-less. <laughs> folks like Autumn Swain, who's made sure that our kids have gone on college tours to understand what that is like and set up the light program and, and programs to strengthen and help our kids. Folks like Terry Crawford, who 20 years ago I carried out of a crack house with Rodney Tapp, who is today a certified AOTA counselor, who does work on my staff inside Nehemiah's house with track addicts. Oh, God is good. Oh, thank you, Jesus. The same man I carried out a crack house, I sent into the Nehemiah house. That's because the Spirit said, go. Or Gloria Zeller, who went to Haiti on a missions trip and saw a young man who had a dream and came back and helped to establish a board for that Cosina ministry. And today they have a hospital and a clinic and a school, and I spoke at their graduation about three years ago, but she heard his vision and came back and helped to create a board that funds that work that has changed the lives of people in Awanameth, Haiti. Or folks like Anthony Ward, who's a, who's a police officer who served our kids in school about safety, or Door Creek Church that has created a business called Boomerangs, and they use their proceeds to send money back to decorate our foyer outside the South Madison Center for Culture and Community, who has agreed to help us create a boomerang store so that found a life can can hire youth and children staff so that we can have staff to deal with the, end, with the issues of this community. Or men like Andy Anderson or Chris Rudolph, who are true, two fitness gurus who study at UW La Crosse, who said that they wanted to use their business and their business savvy and their experience in health to change the world. So they created a health club that's called um, CORE, where they allow established businessmen to come and train and nonprofit folks like me. And so now there are men who pour into this ministry because we have sweated and we have done planks and we have done sit-ups together. They've created this business where we can work out together. And between exercises, they want to know what I'm doing. Those men have visited our church and are funding our ministry and don't even call on the name of Christ. <laughs> or folks like Renee Daniels who helps developmentally disabled folks in schools by showing them dignity and care. Or Roxanne Johnson and her team. Or Brian and Tracy and their team. Or folks like Alexander G. Lewis who spent time in, in Haiti serving kids that are still recovering their lives. Or the Dominican Republic practicing your Spanish so that you can teach children that just because you're homeless and naked doesn't mean that Jesus does not love you. <laughs> or folks like Terrence and Kira who are heading out to California this week to serve some of the world's hurting folks, to work with Rebecca Bolin and to serve some of the down and out people, or people like Rebecca Bolin, who's committed to Skid Row and putting Fountain of Life Long Beach right in Skid Row in California. <laughs> folks like Patrick Gates, who's worked with young men and has modeled to them things that his father taught them, how to be a good man and a good husband and responsible. And Christians in Thailand, 
who help prostitutes with their hair and makeup. Not so that they look better and make more money, because if they didn't do that, where else would they have an opportunity to talk to her, to tell her who she really is? And so while they're fixing her hair and putting flowers in her ear, and while they're painting up her fingers and her toes, they're reminding her, you don't have to do this. There's a God who sees your beauty, and you don't have to sell it. Your beauty is not for sale. We would think that's wrong. Churches shouldn't be doing makeup and hair for prostitutes. You're right. You're right. We shouldn't. We should judge them. We should point our fingers at them. We should tell them, you're wrong. You need to know Jesus. But how many prostitutes have you talked to? How many have you led to the Lord? How many have you shared God's message with? Maybe you need a hair makeup parlor. Found of life building this church is just a test. This is a test of our faith. Because if we can put our money together to build a building, we can put our money together and build a school. We can put our money together and build a house. We can put our money together and build a van and buy We can put our money together and we can, and we can help our elders. We can put our money together and feed the hungry. We can put our money together. So we can do things like prayer walks and cookouts for neighbors. I know this doesn't sound spiritual, but neither does selling fish in Thailand or making up hair in Thailand. Mentoring, tutoring, hospice concerts with our music team, emergency shelter for homeless families, or women escaping domestic violence. How about this? We could, we could do things like detonating the self-loathing soul bomb that is exploding and imploding in our marginalized youth by teaching them their beauty and their worth. I'm almost finished. Pimps know how to find the weak and defenseless and make a profit from them. Gang leaders know how to spot loneliness and talent and make profit from them. Drug dealers know how to find the afflicted and easily addicted and make profit for them. Liquor stores know how to spot hurting neighborhoods and make a profit for them. Where is the church? Where is the church? And I'm not talking about buildings, Mount Zion, Dorcree. I'm talking about the people of God. Everyone I showed you was an individual. It's not an organization. It was a person selling fish, a person getting a house, a person tutoring, a person mentoring, a person doing hair and makeup. So when we say, where is the church? I'm not asking where Fountain of Life is or where Mount Zion is. I'm asking, where are you? Prisons and corrupt systems know how to find third grade boys who can't read. So what do we see when we look outside? Something or someone to avoid, something to, or something to redeem, or someone who needs hope. Why the gardens? Why the South Madison Center for Culture and Community? Why the extra classrooms downstairs? Because the king has come, and he's about to liberate the prisoners, and they're going to need some place to go after their release. We need more space because the king is about to release the poor from their poverty, the hungry from their hunger, the loneliness from their lonely from their loneliness. He is about to release the poor and the broken, and they're going to need some place to go and sing and shout and dance and celebrate. It's the birthday of the church, and we need to grow up and act our age and not our shoe size. So come to the party because nobody wants to party alone especially God. He told the church, go. Let's pray. Jesus. 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 My ministers, I need you in place for the communion tables, please. We're just going to worship for just a minute. For just a minute. Here's what I want you to do. I want you just to just know that the Spirit of God is everywhere and just pray where you are. We're just going to take a few minutes. We'll be out of here in just a few. For whatever reason you missed first Sunday and didn't get to come to the Lord's